Hello, I'm Christian Cotha from the Swartz Center for Computation and Neuroscience, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a teaser of what this lecture here is about. So this is an introduction to modern brain-computer interface design. And the first question is, what is a brain-computer interface? And you can think of it as, um, in a sense, a direct link between the brain of a person and a computer. And more precisely, it's a system which um, measures nervous system activity or brain uh, activity and then processes this activity somehow and converts it into an output um, that can be used by a computer. And so it can be used, for example, to uh, restore or replace the brain's natural output um, modalities, and for example, if they're damaged somehow. Or it can be used to derive outputs that are normally not available to a computer, such as the person's mood or things like that. And there's various other applications that can be built around that, some of which I'm going to show you. So when, you, when I say measuring brain activity, how does that actually work? Um, there's a lot of different sensor technologies uh, that can be used. And here's one example that's EEG, which, or electroencephalography, which is one of the most useful. No, you might know this from the hospital where EEG is used a lot. Um, but there is also much sleeker um, devices like this one from Emotive here, which essentially measure the electrical potential at, at the skin here, at the scalp, if you will. And these sensors produce readings which look somewhat like these traces here. This is 10 seconds of EEG uh, over multiple electrodes, multiple sensors, where a person is trying um, to imagine to speak. And so as you see, there is uh, basically nothing in the signal that really tells you what word or vowel the person is speaking at any given time or thinking of in, at any given time. So it's uh, really hard to analyze that data and say convert it into a series of letters. But that's basically the job of a brain computer interface. But I should say that um, doing speech <laughs> recognition from EEG is considered to be extremely hard. And as far as I know, no one has been able to demonstrate that uh, challenge uh, conclusively so far. But there's other things such as reading out the current attention level of a person or so uh, at any given time that you can uh, manage. So uh, these traces that we saw are generated ultimately um, by, by the brain, right? And so um, the reason why BCIs can be built, brain-computer interfaces, is um, because uh, there's billions of neurons in the brain that are engaged in their various tasks uh, and giving rise to, say, everyday experience. Um, and these neurons, uh, like here um, in this picture, which, by the way, normally they are not multicolored. Um, <laughs> this is a particular way of coloring them. These neurons radiate electromagnetic fields, each of them, when they're active. And uh, that's what we can measure. And that's what we can analyze and, and de basically reconstruct some aspect of the person's cognitive state from. They are also consuming chemicals and produce chemicals, which, are, which give rise to other ways of, of building brain-computer interfaces. And of course, all that has to happen in real time. So the question now is, how do you take the traces, like those that we saw, and process these um, into usable outputs? And it turns out this, this is a very hard problem. And um, not only is it hard, it's, um, it's a problem that is just about as hard as taking a picture and asking a computer to label the objects in the picture, say, this is a cat, this is a dog, or as hard as taking a speech waveform and translating that you know, sound and translating that into a series of letters. So um, all these different disciplines uh, that are in machine learning and computational intelligence and artificial intelligence and so on, all these different areas share the same building blocks. And many of those are also necessary to solve the BCI problem. So that involves statistics. Um, we will talk uh, a bit about that. We will also touch on optimization, which is very important to, to design well-performing brain-computer interfaces. We will uh, also use some linear algebra, which is actually a prerequisite. Um, for this course. And this is perhaps 80% of the technology, you know, these areas, also information theory and things like that, which, which are universal to um, 
uh, across various problem types like speech, vision, uh, BCI design, and so on. So that's generally useful knowledge. And lastly, there is also models and techniques and methods that are specific to brain function and brain dynamics uh, here. In other areas, like in, in speech recognition, you need to understand the, the physics of speech production in the throat and all that. And here, in this field, you need to understand the nature of brain dynamics to some extent to do a really good job. So at the heart of, of brain-computer interfacing, like in many other areas, is what is called pattern recognition, or also machine learning, where the, where the idea is that um, the, you use some algorithms to learn what kinds of patterns you need to be looking for in brain dynamics. And you, look, you learn these patterns from example data, like from EEG, as we saw. So th this is uh, a representation that may show up at some stage inside the brain-computer interface, where you could imagine each chunk of the EEG, say five seconds, gives rise to one of these dots in this space. And uh, you might have chunks that were taken under different, under different conditions, like the person was excited, or the person was bored, or the person was in a particular emotional state. And you could imagine that these different label links are represented here as colors. This data actually comes from a different task. Um, but it's the same story for brain-computer interfaces. So the goal is to be able to create representations like that from data, wi which contain interesting structure, and then to be able to learn uh, the patterns in here and learn to recognize the patterns and map that onto useful outputs of the BCI, like the person is excited right now, or the probability that the person just made an error is 85% or things like that. So that is sort of the core of, of a brain-computer interface and machine learning. And there's an interpretation to many of these um, representations. For example, here's a pattern that allows you to discern between two conditions of a person. And that pattern is actually a dynamic process in the brain. It's a connectivity structure over time, which um, basically explains how um, different areas in the brain exchange information uh, over, uh, over a short period of time. And so this is a pattern that was actually learned using machine learning from, from point clouds like we had before. And in fact, this pattern here corresponds also to a single point in a space <laughs> of 30,000 dimensions. So this is the beauty of mathematics in some sense. And we will analyze these data with um, uh, w using you know, MATLAB code and things like that. So we'll be, especially in the exercises, scripting a few things by hand in MATLAB. And there's also a very advanced toolbox that we created at the SWART Center, BCI Lab, which we'll be using extensively in the later parts of the lecture to build uh, well-functioning brain-computer interfaces. And before we get completely lost in algorithms and mathematics and all that, um, <laughs> let's Let's at least bring up the practical uses of, of brain-computer interface technology. So one of the most serious applications of BCIs is um, for people who have lost the ability to control some or all of their muscles. And when I say all of the muscles, there's people who cannot even raise an eyelid. And some conditions that lead to that are diseases like the locked-in syndrome, or ALS. And this is, in fact, an ALS um, sufferer who is using a brain-computer interface to spell. So these people need a way to communicate with their family or with their caregivers or be able to control their wheelchair. And BCI technology is one of the very few technologies that allows them uh, to do these things. Uh, there's a few other ways to, to use residual muscular activity, but, but this is um, uh, one of the biggest applications in the whole field. And there's also uses for healthy people who um, don't necessarily have to use BCI. But here, uh, let's say you have cases where people are in demanding jobs or demanding situations where they might zone out for a second or so. And that's things that we can possibly detect um, from the EEG and where, where we can tell the car, say, uh, the person is going to slam the brake um, and that can save you a few meters. Uh, this is actually from a braking or lane change type study. And then there's, of course, also leisurely um, uses such as computer games. Here is a, um, a, an old Star Wars game that has a BCI hooked up to it. And the idea here is um, the force power of the player 
um, is modulated by his um, relaxation level. So the more relaxed he is, the better the force works for him. So, um, and there is a variety of game uses um, that exist for BCIs. And that's also one of the very first things on the market, this whole area. So I hope that gave you uh, a nice little introduction of what this lecture is about. And I hope you enjoy. Thanks.